Welcome to Common Sense by Thomas Paine, a presentation of the Cato University, a project of the Cato Institute. Common Sense by Thomas Paine was written by George H. Smith and narrated by Craig Deitchman. The quotations are read by Bill Middleton. This recording of Common Sense by Thomas Paine was produced in 1985 by Carmichael and Carmichael Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Carmichael and Carmichael Incorporated. When John Adams was an old man, he wrote a famous letter to Thomas Jefferson in which he reflected on the meaning of the American Revolution. What do we mean by the Revolution? The war? That was no part of the Revolution. It was only an effect and consequence of it. The Revolution was in the minds of the people, and this was effected from 1760 to 1775 in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. Jefferson agreed that the real American Revolution was a revolution in ideas. In 1760, when George III ascended the throne of England, American colonists were loyal subjects. Within 15 years, however, many colonists were willing to fight against British rule. This transition from loyalty to rebellion was facilitated by a tremendous outpouring of political literature in the American colonies, mainly in the form of pamphlets. Hundreds of pamphlets were published, and they found eager readers among virtually every segment of the colonial population, from farmers to merchants. The arguments contained in these pamphlets were vital to the revolution in ideas. Among these pamphlets, none had a more dramatic effect than Thomas Paine's Common Sense, published in January of 1776. The impact of Common Sense was astonishing. In an age when an average pamphlet might sell a few thousand copies at best, Common Sense went through 25 printings in one year, and, as Payne observed, its sales were phenomenal. I believe the number of copies printed and sold in America was not short of 150,000, and is the greatest sale that any performance ever had since the use of letters, exclusive of the great run it had in England and Ireland. Common Sense was destined to become a classic. It contains some of the most stirring passages in American literature. O oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only the tyranny but the tyrant, stand forth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger, and England hath given her warning to depart. Oh, receive the fugitive, and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. Common sense converted thousands of Americans to the cause of independence, declared a Connecticut man. This pamphlet may justly be compared to a land flood that sweeps all before it. We were blind, but on reading these enlightening words, the scales have fallen from our eyes. Common sense, according to the distinguished historian Bernard Balin, is the most brilliant pamphlet written during the American Revolution, and one of the most brilliant pamphlets ever written in the English language. What does common sense say, and why did it have such a powerful influence on the thinking of Americans? This presentation addresses these questions. We'll discuss three aspects of common sense. First, we'll outline the events leading to the writing and publication of common sense. Next, in order to understand the evolution of American attitudes about independence, we'll touch on some of the conflicts between England and America that eventually erupted into violent hostilities. Finally, we shall turn to the text of common sense itself, and through quoting significant passages, explore what it has to say. Let's begin by traveling back to the city of Philadelphia during the year 1775. Philadelphia, although tiny by modern standards, was the largest city in the American colonies. It was a center of science and culture, boasting an impressive number of bookshops. And it was in one of these bookshops that a happenstance meeting led eventually to the writing of common sense. Benjamin Rush was a prominent physician in Philadelphia who liked to visit bookshops. A good place to browse was Robert Aitken's bookstore and printing shop. Aitken was a well-known printer, and his shop was noted for its books defending American liberty. 
On a fateful day early in 1775, Benjamin Rush visited this store and was introduced to an Englishman in Aitken's employ. This Englishman had arrived in Philadelphia the previous year with letters of introduction from Benjamin Franklin. The Englishman's name was Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine emigrated from England after trying his hand at various occupations, from corset maker to tax collector. In America, he hoped to establish a school for young ladies. Instead, he accepted Aitken's offer to edit a journal called the Pennsylvania Magazine. I brought with me letters of introduction from Dr. Franklin. The terms of Dr. Franklin's recommendation were a worthy, ingenious gentleman, etc. My particular design was to establish an academy on the plan they are conducted in and about London, which I was well acquainted with. I came some months before Dr. Franklin and waited here for his arrival. In the meantime, a person of this city desired me to give him some assistance in conducting a magazine. The work turned out very profitable. Benjamin Rush took a liking to Thomas Paine, especially after reading an article by Paine attacking slavery. Paine was a talented writer, and like Rush, he favored American independence. The Continental Congress was currently meeting in Philadelphia, so the city was buzzing with political activity. A forceful argument for independence presented now would be especially well-timed because it might win over some of the many delegates who longed for reconciliation with England. Benjamin Rush had considered publishing a defense of American independence, but he abandoned the idea. Why? Because in his words, he shuddered at the prospect of the consequence of its not being well received. Independence was a radical cause, so Rush feared his business would suffer if he defended it publicly. He had previously taken up another unpopular cause by calling for the abolition of slavery, only to see his medical practice plummet. But here was Thomas Paine, an Englishman, new to the colonies, who had far less to risk in the way of reputation and job security. So Rush suggested that Paine write the pamphlet instead. Here is how Rush recalled the conversation. I mentioned the subject of independence to Mr. Payne and asked him what he thought of writing a pamphlet upon it. I suggested to him that he had nothing to fear from the popular odium to which such a publication might expose him, for he could live anywhere, but that my profession and connections, which tied me to Philadelphia, where a great majority of the citizens and some of my friends were hostile to a separation of our country from Great Britain, forbade me to come forward as a pioneer in that important controversy. He readily assented to the proposal, and from time to time he called at my house and read to me every chapter of the proposed pamphlet as he composed it. Thomas Paine began work on common sense in November of 1775. He solicited advice from Sam Adams and others, but accepted only one suggestion of any consequence. Paine wished to call the pamphlet Plain Truth. Benjamin Rush suggested Common Sense instead, and Paine immediately agreed. Finding a printer for common sense was not easy. Rush suggested Robert Bell, a printer who favored independence. Bell was a peculiar recommendation in some ways, especially for the straight-laced Benjamin Rush, for Bell openly flouted conventional moral standards. He kept a mistress, fathered an illegitimate daughter, and made no attempt to hide the scandal. But while disapproving of Bell's lifestyle, Rush said that on the subject of independence, Bell was as high-toned as Mr. Paine. Thomas Paine, like many writers, soon fell out with his publisher. Paine wished to donate his profits from the sale of common sense to American soldiers fighting in Canada. After giving these instructions to Bell, Paine became convinced his publisher had double-crossed him. The first edition was printed by Bell on the recommendation of Dr. Rush. I gave him the pamphlet on the following conditions that if any loss should arise, I would pay it. And in order to make him industrious in circulating it, I gave him one half the profits, if it should produce any. I gave a written order to Colonel Joseph Dean and Captain Thomas Pryor, both of this city, to receive the other half and lay it out for mittens for the troops that were going to Quebec. I did this to do honor to the cause. Bell kept the whole amount and abused me in the bargain. Robert Bell denied he violated his agreement with Payne. But whoever was right, Bell displayed courage in this publishing venture. His was the only name to appear on the title page of the first printing. 
Payne did not put any name on the first printing, and signed, written by an Englishman, on the second printing. The risks involved in publishing Common Sense were pointed out by Payne seven years later in 1783. It cannot at this time of day be forgotten that the politics, the opinions, and the prejudices of the country were in direct opposition to the principles contained in Common Sense. And I well know that in Pennsylvania, and I suppose the same in other of the then provinces, it would have been unsafe for a man to have espoused independence in any public company. Was Payne correct? Was independence unpopular in the American colonies as late as January 1776, just six months prior to its formal declaration? To a great extent, yes. The colonists had serious grievances, and they had a history of resisting British authority, but resistance did not imply revolution. Resistance to unjust taxation, the colonists said, was a right of free-born Englishmen. Since the colonies were not represented in the English Parliament, and therefore lacked the means to give or withhold consent, they could not be taxed, except by their own assemblies. This principle was tested in 1765, when Parliament passed the Stamp Act. This was an attempt to raise revenue by taxing paper. All bills of lading, legal documents, newspapers, and so forth, had to carry a special stamp indicating payment of the required taxes. The Stamp Act triggered organized resistance in America. The tactics of resistance included petitions, economic sanctions against England, and occasional mob violence. Internal British politics, unrelated to the Stamp Act, aided the American cause. A power shift in 1766 placed Lord Rockingham at the head of the British ministry. Rockingham opposed the Stamp Act, and he was supported by English merchants suffering from the colonial boycott of English goods. Parliament repealed the detested Stamp Act, while insisting this did not undercut the principle involved. Parliament retained the right to tax the colonies in theory even if that right was not exercised in practice. Thus, at the same time it repealed the Stamp Act, Parliament passed the Declaratory Act. The Declaratory Act stated Parliament's position in no uncertain terms. The colonies in America have been, are, and of right ought to be, subordinate unto and dependent upon the Imperial Crown and Parliament of Great Britain. The King's Majesty by and with the advice and consent of the Lord Spiritual and Temporal and Commons of Great Britain, in Parliament assembled, had, hath, and of right ought to have, full power and authority to make laws and statutes of sufficient force and validity to bind the colonies and people of America, subjects of the Crown of Great Britain, in all cases whatsoever. When news of the Stamp Act's repeal reached America, the colonists were jubilant. Too jubilant, perhaps. Only a few colonists noticed the ominous implications of the Declaratory Act. It was widely dismissed as an attempt by Parliament to save face. But the Declaratory Act was more than a face-saving device to a young and ambitious English politician named Charles Townsend. Townsend pushed a Revenue Act through Parliament. This act taxed various commodities entering the colonies, including glass, paper, and tea. Townsend predicted an annual revenue of £40,000 sterling from this measure, which could be used to pay the salaries of royal officials stationed in America. This money would not materialize from a mere decree of Parliament, however. Money had to be collected in American ports, so Townsend strengthened the power of customs officials. Smuggling, above all, had to be severely curtailed. Smuggling was the weak link in any effort by England to tax colonial imports. Did Parliament have the theoretical right to tax the colonies? The two sides could argue until they were blue in the face, but as a matter of hard fact, a tax on imports raised the price of those commodities. This created a profit opportunity for smugglers who could evade duties and sell the same goods for a cheaper price. Smuggling was widespread, not only in the colonies, but in England as well. Consider the importation of tea into England, which was monopolized by the East India Company. This company enjoyed the legal privilege to import tea, a privilege denied by the English government to other merchants. Without fear of competition, the East India Company could charge high prices, but the government naturally wanted its share of the take, so a heavy tax was placed on all imported tea. 
In theory, this cozy arrangement between government and business should have reaped handsome profits for both parties at the expense of hapless consumers. And it did for a while. But trade has a way of finding its own channels. Smuggling became a major occupation of many villages dotting the English coastline. By the early 1760s, over half of England's tea, seven million pounds each year, entered the country illegally through smuggling. If the British government could not stop smuggling at home, the prospect of stopping it in the colonies, 3,000 miles away, was bleak indeed. Customs officials in America were bribed by smugglers to look the other way. If an official took his job seriously enough to apprehend a culprit, he then had to contend with the unruly Americans who saw their smugglers as heroic defenders of free trade. Colonial courts usually acquitted the smuggler, returned his confiscated goods, and fined the customs official for any damages. In 1770, a frustrated customs agent tried to explain his predicament to the British government. In this country, an officer of the customs ought to see his way very clear before he ventures to make a seizure, because he is sure of having every possible difficulty thrown in his way. He is looked upon as an enemy to the community and treated accordingly. And whether he succeeds or not, he's sure never to be forgiven, and thinks himself fortunate if his punishment is deferred to a future day. When new commissioners arrived in America to enforce the Revenue Act, they did not expect to be welcomed with open arms. The collector for the port of Boston, Joseph Harrison, described his concern. I was full of apprehensions that some tumults and riots would be raised here on the arrival of the new commissioners of the customs. No open violences had been committed on that occasion, but the people contented themselves in venting their ill humors and rancor against the late parliamentary regulations and abuse and invective only. Since then... A dangerous and seditious combination has been formed to resist the execution of those acts of Parliament, and indeed of all others that impose any duties payable in the colonies. In order to effect this, the newspapers have been employed all this last winter in circulating a vast number of inflaming and seditious publications, tending to poison and incense the minds of the people, and alienate them from all regard and obedience to the legislature of the mother country. The common cry now is, pay no duties. Save your money, and you save your country. Smuggling has become public virtue and patriotism. Harrison knew how difficult it was to stop smuggling among a people who saw nothing wrong with it. Large quantities of dutiable goods have been smuggled in a most audacious manner, but though publicly known and talked of, such is the temper of the times that no legal information could be obtained so as to prosecute or make any seizure of them. American resistance to the Townsend duties prompted British authorities to use soldiers for enforcement. Boston was seen as the nucleus of the resistance movement, so additional British troops were stationed in and around the city. This aggravated the colonists even more. Americans had long opposed standing armies or armies maintained in peacetime. It was widely believed that standing armies would be used to force the decrees of a tyrant upon his own subjects. Now, British troops were stationed among hostile Bostonians. A clash was bound to occur. And so it did on the evening of March 5, 1770. A scuffle between a civilian and a soldier escalated until five Bostonians were killed by British troops. This became known as the Boston Massacre. Had the British government toughened its policy after the Boston Massacre, a full-scale revolution might have erupted five years earlier than it actually did. But a new prime minister, Lord North, called for the repeal of the towns and duties, and he promised not to impose other duties during his administration. This conciliatory gesture appeased most Americans, and it halted the momentum of the resistance movement. When we say that Parliament repealed the towns and duties, we should note an important and ultimately fatal exception. Lord North wanted to retain the duty on tea. This duty was quite small, so it promised little revenue even in ideal circumstances. But the circumstances in America, as usual, were far from ideal. The Americans continued their smuggling ways and satisfied much of their tea habit with illegal Dutch tea. If the duty on tea yielded so little money, 
Why did Lord North want to keep it? As a symbolic measure, essentially, we have seen how the Declaratory Act, following the repeal of the Stamp Act, was an assertion of Parliament's right to tax. The tea duty was retained for a similar reason. It was to remind the colonists who was boss, even if the boss backed down. Lord North's policies pacified the colonies for a while, but the conflict flared up again in May of 1773 when Parliament passed the Tea Act. This was an effort to bail out the financially troubled East India Company, one of England's most powerful financial institutions. This once mighty company had fallen into severe financial difficulties and now owed the government a good deal of money. How could this money be raised and the company saved? Well, the East India Company had a lot of tea rotting in warehouses. It could not unload this tea in England at competitive prices when smuggled tea was so easily obtained. The Tea Act permitted the company to export this surplus tea directly to the colonies, and it provided a full refund, or drawback as it was called, of all taxes previously collected on this tea in England. The drawback of duties on exported tea meant the East India Company could sell its tea very cheaply in America, perhaps even undercutting the price of smuggled Dutch tea. Surely the colonists, who loved their tea like all good Englishmen, would welcome this lower price. The Tea Act attracted little attention when it passed. There was little concern among members of Parliament about its consequences, and it might have had no effect at all if a rather technical point about the measure had been decided differently. Parliament agreed that the East India Company would get a drawback on tea duties collected in England. But what about the small duty collected in American ports? That symbolic remnant of parliamentary authority. Should the company be exempt from this duty as well? The East India Company wanted exemption, and not just for financial reasons. It wanted to steer clear of any conflict between America and Britain. How would Americans feel when this monopoly company willingly paid duties in American ports? Some far-sighted members of Parliament recommended collecting the tax in England instead of America, thus avoiding the wrath of irate colonists. But Lord North wanted none of this. The tea duty was a symbol of British authority, and it would be collected from all importers of tea into the colonies, including the East India Company. This was the most disastrous decision of Lord North's political career, and it was one of the most disastrous decisions in England's history as an imperial power. Leaders of the colonial resistance movement looked beyond the lure of cheaper tea to the political implications of the Tea Act. They didn't like the idea of a monopoly company gaining a foothold in America and didn't want a dangerous precedent to be set. If Americans looked the other way, while the East India Company paid duties in American ports, they would, in effect, be conceding the right of Parliament to tax. Additional taxes based on the East India precedent were sure to follow, thereby endangering the principle for which colonists had struggled since 1763. As one influential writer of the time put it, Let the right be once fixed and established. It will be very easy to keep adding tax to tax. Till the loads grow so heavy and are so fast bound that we can never shake them off. The Tea Act was a test. Would Americans contentedly sip their cheaper tea while surrendering their rights to Parliament? The Declaratory Act once again reared its ugly head. In 1782, as Thomas Paine looked back on the events leading to war with England, he saw a clear connection between the Declaratory Act of 1766 and the Tea Act of 1773. The Stamp Act, it is true, was repealed in two years after it was passed, but it was immediately followed by one of infinitely more mischievous magnitude. I mean the Declaratory Act, which asserted the right, as it was styled, of the British Parliament to bind America in all cases whatsoever. If then the Stamp Act was an usurpation of the Americans' most precious and sacred rights, the Declaratory Act left them no rights at all, and contained the full-grown seeds of the most despotic government ever exercised in the world. It placed America not only in the lowest, but in the basest state of vassalage, because it demanded an unconditional submission in everything. There is no despotism to which this iniquitous law did not extend. It stopped nowhere. It went to everything. It took in with it the whole life of man, 
or if I may so express it, an eternity of circumstances. It is the nature of law to require obedience, but this demanded servitude. On the condition of an American, under the operation of it, was not that of a subject, but a vassal. Payne insists that Americans objected to the Tea Act not because of the amount of the duty, large or small, but because of the principle involved. It was the principle, of which the tax made but a part, and the quantity still less, that formed the ground on which America resisted. American compliance with the Tea Act would have meant capitulation to the Declaratory Act. The tax on tea was neither more nor less than an experiment to establish the practice of a declaratory law upon, model into the more fashionable phrase of the universal supremacy of Parliament. For until this time, the declaratory law had lain dormant, and the framers of it had contented themselves with barely declaring an opinion. Therefore, the whole question with America, in the opening of the dispute, was, shall we be bound in all cases whatsoever by the British Parliament, or shall we not? For submission to the Tea or Tax Act implied an acknowledgment of the Declaratory Act, or in other words, of the universal supremacy of Parliament, which, as they never intended to do, it was necessary they should oppose it in its first stage of execution. Seaport towns passed resolutions against the Tea Act and pressured colonial agents of the East India Company to resign their posts. This worked in Philadelphia and in New York, but not in Boston, where two of the agents were sons of the Massachusetts governor, Thomas Hutchinson. Hutchinson had been fighting the resistance movement for years, and he hated it passionately. Some years before, during resistance to the Stamp Act, Hutchinson had seen protesters demolish his beautiful house, brick by brick, so he was in no mood to capitulate. And though the self-righteous governor would deny he was motivated by anything except the highest sense of duty, we should keep economic realities in mind. Thomas Hutchinson had a considerable fortune invested in East India Company stock, nearly 4,000 pounds sterling. In addition, his yearly salary as royal governor, around 1,500 pounds sterling, came from tea duty revenues. It is safe to say that when it came to collecting the duties on East India tea, there was a happy coincidence between the governor's service to his country and the governor's service to himself. Three ships arrived in Boston Harbor with East India tea, and Hutchinson was determined to see the tea unloaded and the duties paid. Bostonians were equally determined to prevent the tea from coming ashore. The ships were permitted to unload all of their cargo except tea. Bostonians demanded the ships return to England with their tea, and they posted local militia to guard against secret unloading. But the vessels couldn't leave, even if their captains wanted them to. Governor Hutchinson would not permit it. The ships had officially docked and were recorded in the customs log. They could not depart until all duties had been paid, including the duties on tea. This standoff would end in 20 days. After this time, any commodities with unpaid duties were subject to confiscation and sale by the government. After December 16, 1773, the tea was due to be seized, which meant unloading would be enforced by British soldiers. Governor Hutchinson was just hours away from a victory over his opponents, but on the evening of the 16th, after Hutchinson refused a last-minute plea to allow the ships to leave, Bostonians struck with the famous Boston Tea Party. Around 200 men, dressed as Indians, boarded the ships and threw overboard 342 chests of tea valued at 9,000 pounds sterling. As these men went to work, quietly and systematically, a large crowd of supporters, some 8,000 strong, looked on. Years later, a participant in the Boston Tea Party recalled some of its details. It was now evening, and I immediately dressed myself in the costume of an Indian, equipped with a small hatchet, which I and my associates denominated the tomahawk, with which, and a club, after having painted my face and hands with coal dust in the shop of a blacksmith, I repaired to Griffin's Wharf, where the ships lay that contained the tea. When I first appeared in the street, after being thus disguised, I fell in with many who were dressed, equipped, and painted as I was, and who fell in with me and marched in order to the place of our destination. When we arrived at the wharf, there were three of our number who assumed an authority to direct our operations, to which we readily submitted. 
they divided us into three parties for the purpose of boarding the three ships which contained the tea at the same time. The name of him who commanded the division to which I was assigned was Leonard Pitt. The names of the other commanders I never knew. We were immediately ordered by the respective commanders to board all the ships at the same time, which we promptly obeyed. We then were ordered by our commanders to open the hatches and take out all the chests of tea and throw them overboard, and we immediately proceeded to execute the orders, first cutting and splitting the chest with our tomahawks so as thoroughly to expose them to the effects of the water. In about three hours from the time we went on board, we had thus broken and thrown overboard every tea chest to be found in the ship, while those in the other ships were disposing of the tea in the same way at the same time. The Boston Tea Party was so well planned and executed that the identity of most participants remains unknown to this day. Even this participant did not know who most of his fellow Indians were. We then quietly retired to our several places of residence without having any conversation with each other or taking any measures to discover who were our associates. Nor do I recollect of our having had the knowledge of the name of a single individual concerned in that affair, except that of Leonard Pitt, the commander of my division, whom I have mentioned. There appeared to be an understanding that each individual should volunteer his services, keep his own secret, and risk the consequence for himself. No disorder took place during that transaction, and it was observed at that time that the stillest night ensued that Boston had enjoyed for many months. When John Adams heard about the Boston Tea Party, he was ecstatic. This is the most significant movement of all. There is a dignity, a majesty, a sublimity in this last effort of the patriots that I greatly admire. The destruction of the tea is so bold, so daring, so firm, intrepid, and inflexible, and it must have important consequences, and so lasting that I cannot but consider it as an epoch in history. Understandably, the glee of John Adams was not shared by the British government. When news of the Tea Party reached Parliament, most of its members were outraged. In the vivid language of one member, The town of Boston ought to be knocked about their ears and destroyed. I am of the opinion that you will never meet with that proper obedience to the laws of this country until you have destroyed that nest of locusts. Lord North indignantly recounted the crimes of America to his outraged colleagues. It was time for these lawless rebels to feel a fist of British might. The Americans have tarred and feathered your subjects, plundered your merchants, burnt your ships, denied all obedience to your laws and authority... Yet so clement and so long forbearing has our conduct been that it is incumbent on us now to take a different course. Whatever may be the consequence, we must risk something. If we do not, all is over. In response to the Boston Tea Party, Parliament passed four bills known as the Coercive Acts. The Americans call them the Intolerable Acts. The port of Boston was closed until reparations were paid and until Bostonians showed proper respect for law and order. A military governor, General Gage, replaced the civilian Thomas Hutchinson. Plans were made to beef up the British military in Massachusetts, and civilians were required to provide lodging for soldiers if barracks were unavailable. The Charter of Massachusetts was revoked, and the power to appoint local officials reverted to British authorities. Then, to add insult to injury, if a British official killed someone in the line of duty, he was not to be tried in a provincial court where the jury might prove unsympathetic to the cause of law and order. He could be tried in England instead. The Intolerable Acts effectively placed Massachusetts under martial law. The English government clearly meant business. By imposing severe measures, it hoped to nip resistance in the bud and to intimidate other colonies into submission. The attempt backfired miserably. American dissidents had long accused the English government of a conspiracy to subvert American liberties, and the Intolerable Acts strengthened their case. Instead of splintering colonial resistance, the Intolerable Acts inspired a stronger union. Fifty-six delegates from twelve colonies convened in Philadelphia on September 5, 1774, to consider appropriate action. 
This was the first Continental Congress. We see that many colonists were willing to resist British authority in 1774 by force if necessary. So what did Thomas Paine mean when he said that independence was an unpopular measure in early 1776? Resistance is one thing, but revolution is another thing entirely. At least this is how Americans saw the matter. Many colonists resisted British law, but they justified this resistance on constitutional grounds in the name of the British Constitution. Now, England did not have a constitution in the sense that we understand the word today. It did not have a written document accompanied by a Bill of Rights. By appealing to the British Constitution, the colonists were referring to various traditions and precedents in English law. Most delegates at the First Continental Congress believed Parliament had acted unconstitutionally, but few delegates were willing to renounce allegiance to the British Crown. Indeed, while denouncing Parliament, colonists were falling over one another to declare loyalty to the King. Independence, if considered at all, was a last resort. A common view was that expressed by James Wilson, a Scotch-Irish lawyer who had arrived in the colonies in 1765. In a pamphlet published in the summer of 1774, Considerations on the Authority of Parliament, Wilson justified opposition to the intolerable acts by appealing to the British Constitution. It is repugnant to the genius of the British Constitution that the colony should be bound by the legislative authority of the Parliament of Great Britain. Only those represented in Parliament, according to Wilson, fall under its jurisdiction, and the colonies were not represented. But allegiance to the king is another matter. It depends not on representation, but on the protection provided by the king for his subjects. The colonists ought to be dependent on the king, because they have hitherto enjoyed, and still continue to enjoy, his protection. Allegiance is the faith and obedience which every subject owes to his prince. Every subject, as soon as he is born, is under the royal protection, and is entitled to all the advantages arising from it. He therefore owes obedience to that royal power from which the protection which he enjoys is derived. Many colonists agreed with Wilson that monarchy is legitimate so long as the king protects his subjects. There was some wishful thinking operating here. The colonists believed in a tacit agreement, an implied contract, so to speak, underlying the authority of the king. The king, in his coronation oath, promises to protect the life and liberty of his subjects in exchange for which his subjects are bound to obey him. This theory permitted the colonists to deny the authority of Parliament without denying the authority of the king. But the same theory had another implication, one far more radical. If monarchical authority is conditional, if it depends on the king keeping his side of an agreement, then it is possible for the king to default on his obligation and thereby free his subjects from the duty of obedience. The Continental Congress did not surrender to the Coercive Acts. It declared them unconstitutional, called for economic sanctions against Britain, and suggested that Massachusetts form its own government and make military preparations. These measures were justified in the name of the British Constitution. In a declaration of grievances issued on October 14, 1774, the Congress argued that Americans are entitled to all the rights, liberties, and immunities of free and natural-born subjects within the realm of England. The colony should be ruled by the common law of England. The intolerable acts, it declared, violate English law and the English Constitution. This is the language of constitutional resistance, not of revolutionary independence. This fine distinction between resistance and revolution escaped the British government. British leaders were convinced that a rebellion was in progress and that drastic measures were called for. They were also convinced, wrongly as it turned out, that resistance was inspired and led by a few insurgents centered in Massachusetts, and that it lacked much support elsewhere. England was at this time the most powerful of countries, and the most formidable imperial power since the days of Rome. What chance did America have if England decided to throw its weight around? One man who knew something about weight was the corpulent Earl of Sandwich, whose major claim to fame, aside from having the sandwich named after him, was being known as one of England's most corrupt politicians. The Earl voiced the contempt felt by many English politicians toward the fighting ability of the Americans. Suppose the colonies do abound in men, what does that signify? 
They are raw and disciplined, cowardly men. I wish instead of forty or fifty thousand of these brave fellows, they would produce in the field at least two hundred thousand. The more the better. The easier would be the conquest. If they did not run away, they would starve themselves into compliance with our measures. Are these the men to fright us from the post of honor? Believe me, my lords, the very sound of a cannon would carry them off as fast as our feet could carry them. <laughs> Surely, a decisive military action by well-trained British troops would crush the rebellion in its embryonic stage. Accordingly, Massachusetts was declared to be in a state of rebellion, and General Gage, military governor of Massachusetts, was ordered to restore the vigor of government through military action. Within days of receiving this order, General Gage dispatched seven hundred soldiers to capture military supplies stored at Concord. They were also told to arrest John Hancock and Sam Adams, the two notorious ringleaders of rebellion. On April nineteenth, seventeen seventy-five, these troops encountered Colonial Minutemen at Lexington, and eight Americans were killed. More fighting occurred on the way to Concord, and the British suffered severe casualties on their return to Boston as colonists fired at them from behind rocks, trees, and bushes. April 19th was a turning point in the cause of independence. The war had begun in earnest. No more powerful argument could be made against reconciliation than the spilling of American blood on Lexington Green. Indeed, as Thomas Paine recalls in Common Sense, his conversion to independence occurred because of that day. No man was a warmer wisher for reconciliation than myself before the fatal 19th of April, 1775. But the moment the event of that day was made known, I rejected the hardened, sullen-tempered Pharaoh of England forever, and disdained the wretch that, with the pretended title of father of his people, can unfeelingly hear of their slaughter, and composedly sleep with their blood upon his soul. Theoretical arguments against independence became irrelevant after Lexington and Concord. By referring the matter from argument to arms, a new era for politics is struck. A new method of thinking hath arisen. All plans, proposals, etc., prior to the 19th of April, that is, to the commencement of hostilities, are like the almanacs of the last year, which, though proper then, are superseded and useless now. With the wisdom of hindsight, we can say that the eventual conversion of many Americans to independence was inevitable after the fighting at Lexington and Concord. It made both the Americans and the British more intractable. The Americans saw innocent patriots butchered by British soldiers as they attempted to defend their homes and families. The British saw loyal soldiers of the crown who, in their efforts to restore law and order, were picked off by cowardly insurgents skulking behind rocks and bushes. The Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia three weeks after this fighting. Military preparations were ordered throughout the colonies. George Washington was appointed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, and plans were made to lay siege to the British forces occupying Boston. A month later, the famous Battle of Bunker Hill occurred. Still, the Continental Congress clung to its official line of reconciliation and loyalty to the British crown. On July 8, 1775, it issued a petition to the king called the Olive Branch Petition. This petition defended colonial self-defense and resurrected the old line that evil advisers to the king, rather than the king himself, were to blame for British atrocities. The petition went on to say, Attached to your majesty's person, family, and government with all the devotion that principle and affection can inspire, connected with Great Britain by the strongest ties that can unite societies, and deploring every event that tends in any degree to weaken them, we solemnly assure your majesty that we not only most ardently desire the former harmony between her and these colonies may be restored, but that a concord may be established between them upon so firm a basis as to perpetuate its blessings uninterrupted by any future dissensions to succeeding generations in both countries, and to transmit Our Majesty's name to posterity 
adorned with that signal and lasting glory that has attended the memory of those illustrious personages, whose virtues and abilities have extricated states from dangerous convulsions, and by securing happiness to others, have erected the most noble and durable monuments to their own fame. As this petition made its way to England across 3,000 miles of ocean, we may well imagine how radicals in the Continental Congress were sickened by its slavish appeal to George III. The radical case was strengthened some months later when Congress learned that the king had refused the Olive Branch petition, that he had proclaimed the colonies to be in a state of rebellion, and that he had begun recruiting feared German mercenaries, Hessians they were called, to enforce order in the colonies. Such was the atmosphere in Philadelphia when Thomas Paine began work on common sense. The proponents of independence were frustrated by American hesitation in the face of British aggression. Even the latest rebuff from England did not persuade the Continental Congress to support independence, nor, as Paine noted, did independence find broad support among the general population. The events following Lexington and Concord, however, permit us to understand what contemporaries meant and what historians mean today when they say that Thomas Paine's common sense was perfectly timed and lit a powder keg that had been accumulating in America for some time. Historians tell us that Thomas Paine advanced no new arguments for independence. Even John Adams, always something of a curmudgeon, snarled that Paine's arguments were unoriginal that the case for independence had been made long before this Englishman happened on the scene. There is truth in this claim. Thomas Paine was new to America, and he was no pioneer in his call for independence. But Paine's timing was perfect. Common sense hit a sensitive nerve at precisely the right time. And even more important, Thomas Paine could write to the common man. John Adams prided himself on his learning and scholarship. His writing, laced with classical references and quotations, could seem ponderous to the common man. Thomas Paine made no such claim to scholarship. He wrote plainly, simply, and with incredible effectiveness. Hailing from a lower-class background in England, Paine wrote in straightforward prose that appealed to the average man in a way that John Adams never could. Some historians have even suggested that common sense inaugurated a new style in political literature. John Adams may have known the arguments, but Paine knew both the arguments and the audience. While the Continental Congress was addressing petitions to the King's Most Excellent Majesty and to His Most Gracious Sovereign, Paine was calling the same king a freeloader with a gun. In England, a king hath little more to do than to make war and give away places, which in plain terms is to impoverish the nation and set it together by the ears. A pretty business indeed for a man to be allowed 800,000 sterling a year for, and worshipped into the bargain. Of more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God than all the crown ruffians that ever lived. While colonial scholars engaged in intricate debates about the historical origins of monarchical authority, Paine cut to the heart of the matter. Referring to William the Conqueror and the Norman Conquest of 1066, Paine says, A French bastard landing with an armed banditti and establishing himself King of England against the consent of the natives is in plain terms a very paltry, rascally original. It certainly hath no divinity in it. However, it is needless to spend much time in exposing the folly of hereditary right. If there are any so weak as to believe it, let them promiscuously worship the ass and lion and welcome. I shall neither copy their humility nor disturb their devotion. Thomas Paine was not one to mince words, but a serious case for independence required more than a few good shots at the king. Resistance leaders respected theoretical arguments but they were also seasoned politicians with a fixed eye on political realities. Even if an overwhelming theoretical case could be made for independence, England was not about to defer to superior arguments and go home. The thirteen mainland colonies had no navy and no army to speak of except for the local citizen militias. Patrick Henry declared he was an American first and a Virginian second, but most Americans continued to identify with their provinces. Moreover, some colonies seemed to hate other colonies more than they hated Britain, especially when it came to conflicting land claims. 
Given these liabilities, what were the odds that the Americans could defeat the unmatched military power of England? Not very good, to say the least. And the odds were even worse when the Loyalists were figured in. Possibly one-third of the colonists wished to remain British subjects, and many of these Loyalists would fight on the British side if a full-scale war erupted. A war for independence would not only be a war against an imperial power, it would be a civil war as well, where neighbor would fight neighbor. This was a terrifying prospect, for civil wars are usually the bloodiest of wars. Thus, if Thomas Paine was to win his case, he had to argue on two fronts. He had to make the theoretical case for independence, and he had to convince the skeptics that America could emerge victorious in a war with Britain. Let us now turn to the text of Common Sense and see how Thomas Paine presents his arguments. Common Sense was first advertised for sale on January 9, 1776. Its complete title is Common Sense, addressed to the inhabitants of America on the following interesting subjects. 1. Of the origin and design of government in general, with concise remarks on the English Constitution. 2. Of monarchy and hereditary succession. 3. Thoughts on the present state of American affairs. 4. Of the present ability of America, with some miscellaneous reflections. Despite his lengthy title, Common Sense is a pamphlet, not a book. Its contents are fairly brief, and this permits us to quote a substantial portion of it in the course of presenting its arguments. We should also understand that Paine revised and expanded Common Sense after the first edition. However, since the first edition is the one that took America by storm, this is the edition considered here. Common Sense begins with a theory of society and government. Thomas Paine did not need to argue for this theory in detail because most Americans, including those opposed to independence, shared his belief that government should be kept to the minimum necessary to protect individual rights. It was shrewd of Paine to launch his controversial defense of independence by establishing a common ground with his opponents. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants, and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one encourages intercourse, the other creates distinctions. The first is patron, the last is a punisher. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, in its worst state an intolerable one. For when we suffer, or are exposed to the same miseries by a government, which we might expect in a country without government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we furnish the means by which we suffer. Government, like dress, is the barge of lost innocence. The palaces of kings are built on the bowers of paradise. For were the impulses of conscience clear, uniform, and irresistibly obeyed, man would need no other lawgiver. But that not being the case, he finds it necessary to surrender up a part of his property to furnish means for the protection of the rest. And this he is induced to do by the same prudence which in every other case advises him out of two evils to choose the least. Wherefore, security being the true design and end of government, it unanswerably follows that whatever form thereof appears most likely to ensure it to us, with the least expense and greatest benefit, is preferable to all others. Paine reinforces his point with an illustration. Imagine an isolated part of the world inhabited by a few people. These people would naturally come together for economic exchange, companionship, mutual aid, and protection. The reciprocal benefits of voluntary cooperation are like a gravitating power attracting individuals to society. But society brings dangers with it. Humans are not morally perfect. Some will threaten the liberty and property of others. This requires forming a government for mutual protection. The members of a small colony might assemble under a tree and decide how best to protect themselves. As this colony grows, however, and as its problems become more complex, it is impractical for every member to attend public meetings in person. Instead, 
people will vote for representatives to act in their behalf and to represent their interests. Here then is the origin and rise of government, namely a mode rendered necessary by the inability of moral virtue to govern the world. Here too is the design and end of government, that is to say, freedom and security. And however our eyes may be dazzled with show, or our ears deceived by sound, however prejudice may warp our wills, or interest darken our understanding, the simple voice of nature and of reason will say, "'Tis right." It is important to understand what Paine is not saying. He is not saying that all governments actually began in the way he describes. He is not offering an historical account of government. Rather, he is constructing a theoretical model in order to determine the justification for government. This was a common procedure in the 18th century. Political theorists would postulate what they called a state of nature, that is, a society without government, and then speculate what would motivate people to establish a government. Paine asks an important question. Why would a person surrender part of his natural liberty to a government? We know why a person would join a society, because voluntary cooperation benefits everyone, but this cannot justify government, because government, unlike society, is based on physical force. For what possible reason would a person sacrifice the blessings of liberty for an institution based on coercion. There is basically one reason, according to Paine. A person will surrender part of his liberty to government if he is thereby attaining greater security for the rest of his liberty. In order to survive, a person needs to labor and to consume the fruits of his labor. When his liberty and property are threatened, as they can be in society, a person will look to government for security and safety. The best government provides these services for the least cost. This model of government, Paine says, is very simple, and this simplicity is its chief virtue. I draw my idea of the form of government from a principle in nature which no art can overturn. That is to say, that the more simple anything is, the less liable it is to be disordered, and the easier repaired when disordered. A simple government with limited powers is able to resist corruption at the hands of power-hungry men. And should this government become corrupt, it is more easily restored to its pristine condition than more complex forms of government. Here, Paine leaves the common ground from which he started and ventures into a controversial area. Although Americans agreed with Paine that government should protect liberty and property, Many of them also believe that a complex form of government is most desirable. Indeed, many colonials admired the complexity exhibited by the British Constitution. We have said that the word Constitution was used rather loosely in the 18th century. It did not necessarily refer to a written document. In the controversy over simple versus complex government, the term British Constitution referred to the structure of the British government especially to its division of powers in the King, the House of Lords, and the House of Commons. Each of these branches represented different interests, and each branch served to check the power of the others. In this way, it was argued, no one group could monopolize power and establish tyranny. This is where Americans got their theory of a division and balance of powers, a theory they eventually used in the United States Constitution. The British Constitution was seen as an ideal model, as a barrier to totalitarian government. This, at least, was the theory of the British government. In practice, it was far different. Even American defenders of the British Constitution acknowledged that it had become corrupt, that the executive power in the person of the king had acquired too much power. The king had gained undue influence over Parliament through a process known as patronage. This means that the king by dispensing pensions and lucrative jobs, would bribe members of Parliament to vote according to his will. That the Crown is this overbearing part of the English Constitution needs not be mentioned, and that it derives its whole consequence merely from being the giver of places and pensions is self-evident. Wherefore, though we have been wise enough to shut and lock a door against absolute monarchy, we at the same time have been foolish enough to put the crown in possession of the key. 
the majority of English politicians saw nothing wrong with this procedure. Patronage by the crown had a long and honorable history, but one man's patronage is another man's corruption, and patronage in England was commonly seen as corruption in America. Although Thomas Paine mentions this corruption, it is not his main argument against British rule. If common sense had done nothing more than denounce corruption, it would have been indistinguishable from dozens of other pamphlets. Common sense created a sensation because it attacks the British Constitution in theory. Paine launches what he calls an inquiry into the constitutional errors in the English form of government. To say the British Constitution preserves liberty, Paine contends, is nonsense. Americans should stop fooling themselves. They should stop longing to restore a mythical balance of constitutional powers and see the British Constitution as it really is. To say that the Constitution of England is a union of three powers reciprocally checking each other is farcical. Either the words have no meaning, or they are flat contradictions. Far from safeguarding liberty, Paine says. The complexity of the British Constitution makes it worse in some ways than even a despotic government. Absolute governments, though the disgrace of human nature, have this advantage with them that they are simple. If the people suffer, they know the head from which their suffering springs, know likewise the remedy, and are not bewildered by a variety of causes and cures. But the Constitution of England is so exceedingly complex. That the nation may suffer for years together without being able to discover in which part the fault lies, some will say in one and some in another, and every political physician will advise a different medicine. Defenders of England pointed to the liberty enjoyed by Englishmen, maintaining that this liberty was made possible by the British Constitution. Paine disagrees. The king is as powerful in England as in any other country. Owing to his power of patronage, and the so-called constitution does not check this power. The prejudice of Englishmen in favour of their own government by king, lords, and commons arises as much or more from national pride than reason. Individuals are undoubtedly safer in England than in some other countries, but the will of the king is as much the law of the land in Britain as in France. With this difference. That instead of proceeding directly from his mouth, it is handed to the people under the more formidable shape of an act of Parliament, for the fate of Charles the First hath only made kings more subtle, not more just. Charles the First, remember, was executed in the mid seventeenth century after the English Civil War. This may have taught future kings to be less obvious. Payne remarks, but they still wield tremendous power. Why then does England enjoy a greater degree of liberty than other countries in Europe? Paine gives a straightforward answer. Wherefore, laying aside all national pride and prejudice in favour of modes and forms, the plain truth is that it is wholly owing to the constitution of the people and not to the constitution of the government that the crown is not as oppressive in England as in Turkey. A central part of Paine's attack on the British Constitution is his total rejection of hereditary monarchy. There are some natural distinctions among human beings, but the distinction between king and subjects is not one of them. There is a distinction for which no truly natural or religious reason can be assigned, and that is the distinction of men into kings and subjects. Male and female are the distinctions of nature; good and bad, the distinctions of heaven. But how a race of men came into the world so exalted above the rest and distinguished like some new species is worth inquiring into, and whether they are the means of happiness or of misery to mankind. Paine next discusses the biblical view of monarchy. His interpretation is questionable at times, and we need not explore it in detail. Paine's appeal to the Bible is understandable, given the influence of the Bible on 18th-century writers. But given Paine's personal views, his emphasis on the Bible is rather curious. Years after writing *Common Sense*, Thomas Paine authored an infamous attack on Christianity entitled *Age of Reason*. Much of the abuse Paine suffered in his later life stemmed from this book. Thomas Paine was not an atheist, however; he was a deist. Deism was fairly popular in the 18th century Enlightenment, and it basically meant the belief in a god of nature. Deists typically rejected any belief in supernatural revelation, including the Bible. 
Deism was adopted by a number of founding fathers, including Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Paine was a deist when he wrote Common Sense, which gives a curious slant to his appeal to biblical authority. John Adams suggested that Paine was hypocritical for using an authority he personally rejected. This is one way of looking at the matter. But we should also remember that Paine was writing for a popular audience, many of whom believed in the Bible. Paine was using every possible weapon in his arsenal, including the argument that monarchy is contrary to biblical teaching. Government by kings was first introduced into the world by the heathens, from whom the children of Israel copied the custom. It was the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. Another way Paine attacks monarchy is to trace its beginnings in history. Paine argues that monarchy originated in violence and conquest, which strips it of legitimacy. It is more than probable that could we take off the dark covering of antiquity and trace them to their first rise, that we should find the first of them nothing better than the principal ruffian of some restless gang, whose savage manners or preeminence in subtlety obtained him the title of chief among plunderers, and who by increasing in power and extending his depredations, overawed the quiet and defenseless to purchase their safety by frequent contributions. Paine now applies his general theory to the origin of the British monarchy. That William the Conqueror was an usurper is a fact not to be contradicted. The plain truth is that the antiquity of English monarchy will not bear looking into. In short, monarchy and succession have laid not this or that kingdom only, but the world in blood and ashes. Tis a form of government which the word of God bears testimony against, and blood will attend it. Having completed his critique of monarchy in the British Constitution, Paine moves on to economic considerations. Opponents of independence commonly argued that America benefited from its commercial ties to Britain. This complex system of economic regulations, referred to by Adam Smith as mercantilism, is rejected by Paine. Common Sense was published shortly before Adam Smith's famous defense of free trade, The Wealth of Nations, so Paine did not acquire his views from that source. But free trade arguments were in the air before Adam Smith's systematic presentation, and Paine uses these free trade arguments to support independence. Paine argues that America would have fared as well and probably better if she had never been part of the British Empire. American commerce deals in the necessities of life. So America will always have markets for trade, while eating is the custom of Europe. Our plan is commerce, and that well attended to will secure us the peace and friendship of all Europe, because it is the interest of all Europe to have America a free port. Her trade will always secure her from invaders. I challenge the warmest advocate for reconciliation to show a single advantage that this continent can reap by being connected with Great Britain. I repeat the challenge. Not a single advantage is derived. Our corn will fetch its price in any market in Europe, and our imported goods must be paid for. Buy them where we will. What of the claim that British naval power protected American shipping? America paid for that protection, Payne responds, and it is important to remember that British policies were motivated by self-interest, not by any affection for the colonies. Britain protected America from Britain's enemies, countries that would have had no reason to war with America were it not for the British connection. Independence would mean that the enemies of Britain would no longer be the enemies of America. Two traditional enemies of England, France and Spain, would have no reason to war with America. Alas, we have been long led away by ancient prejudices and made large sacrifices to superstition. We have boasted the protection of Great Britain without considering that her motive was interest, not attachment, that she did not protect us from our enemies on our account, but from her enemies on her own account, from those who had no quarrel with us on any other account and who will always be our enemies on the same account. Let Britain waive her pretensions to the continent or the continent throw off the dependence, and we should be at peace with France and Spain, were they at war with Britain. 
The alliance with Britain means that America will be dragged into European wars waged by monarchs for selfish reasons. The ties between America and Europe should be economic, not political. Neutrality, says Paine, is a safer convoy than a man of war. As Europe is our market for trade, we ought to form no political connection with any part of it. Tis the true interest of America to steer clear of European connections, which she never can do while by her dependence on Britain she has made the make-weight in the scale of British politics. England was often called the mother country, or the parent of the American colonies. Even radicals would sometimes use this metaphor, but Paine rips it to shreds. If we suppose England to be a parent country, then it should be even more ashamed of its conduct, argues Paine, because even brutes do not devour their young. But this grants too much. Europe, and not England, is the parent country of America. This new world hath been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. Hither have they fled, not from the tender embraces of the mother, but from the cruelty of the monster. And it is so far true of England that the same tyranny which drove the first immigrants from home pursues their descendants still. What would be the consequences if America, instead of declaring independence, reconciled with England instead? First, the king would remain as despotic and arbitrary as ever. No laws could be passed in America without his approval. He would use his craft and subtlety to accomplish in the long run what he could not achieve by force and violence in the short run. Second, America might erupt into civil war. Thousands had already suffered at the hands of the British, and thousands more were likely to share the same fate. These people had sacrificed everything for their liberty, and with nothing more to lose, they would fight England to the end. Men of passive tempers look somewhat lightly over the offenses of Britain, and still hoping for the best, are apt to call out, Come! Come! We shall be friends again for all this. But if you say, you can pass the violations over. Then I ask, Hath your house been burnt? Hath your property been destroyed before your face? Are your wife and children destitute of a bed to lie on or bread to live on? Have you lost a parent or a child by their hands, and yourself the ruined and wretched survivor? If you have not, then you are not a judge of those who have. But if you have and still can shake hands with the murderers, then are you unworthy the name of husband, father, friend, or lover. And whatever may be your rank or title in life, you have the heart of a coward and the spirit of a sycophant. Americans do have a legitimate fear, Payne admits, of the unknown. What kind of government would emerge in America if the British were driven out? Here, Payne offers his own reflections on government and lays out a model for a Republican government. Paine believes that the strength of America lay in union. Always remember, he says, that our strength is continental, not provincial. He recommends that each of the thirteen colonies send at least thirty delegates to an American Congress. A president for each Congress will be chosen by ballot from the representatives of one colony. Each colony will have its turn in nominating a president. A three-fifths majority is required to pass laws. This ensures, says Paine, that nothing will become law except what most people consider just. Conspicuous by its absence in this scheme is any kind of monarch. Let it be known, Paine declares, that in America law is king, and there is to be no other. A government of our own is our natural right. And when a man seriously reflects on the precariousness of human affairs, he will become convinced that it is infinitely wiser and safer to form a constitution of our own in a cool and deliberate manner. Paine is optimistic about the military ability of America to defeat England in war. Most Americans were raised in the frontier, and they know how to defend themselves. Tis not in numbers, but in unity that our great strength lies. Yet our present numbers are sufficient to repel the force of all the world. The continent hath at this time the largest disciplined army of any power under heaven. Our land force is more than sufficient. Although America lacked a naval fleet, it possessed the natural resources to build one if necessary. 
No country on the globe is so happily situated or so internally capable of raising a fleet as America. Tar, timber, iron and cordage are her natural produce. We need go abroad for nothing. The military observations in common sense are its weakest part. Payne overestimates the ability of America to build a naval fleet strong enough to challenge the British. And he underestimates the ability of the English to put their full fleet into service. On this issue, various delegates to the Continental Congress were more astute. They realized that America would have to depend on France for naval power. They also realized that France would not aid the colonies unless the goal of the war was independence rather than reconciliation. Why would France assist America if, after defeating Britain, France's traditional enemy, America simply rejoined the British Empire? This practical consideration persuaded a number of colonial leaders to the cause of independence. Common sense, therefore, has its strong points and its weak points. The theoretical arguments and vigorous polemics are generally more convincing than the practical arguments. This helps to explain why common sense converted many average people to the cause of independence, but probably had little influence on the deliberations of the Continental Congress. These strong arguments and ringing passages are also the parts of common sense that make it more than a period piece. Over two hundred years after American independence, they continue to capture the essence of the American dream. The sun never shine on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the affair of a city, a county, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent, of at least one-eighth part of the habitable globe. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity are virtually involved in the contest and will be more or less affected even to the end of time by the proceedings now. We began with a quotation from John Adams about the power of ideas. Thomas Paine was to undergo many hardships in his life, but he, like other founding fathers, never lost confidence in the power of ideas to reshape societies. Long after the publication of Common Sense, near the end of his life, Paine reaffirmed this conviction. An army of principles will penetrate where an army of soldiers cannot. It will succeed where diplomatic management would fail. It is neither the Rhine, the Channel, nor the Ocean that can arrest its progress. It will march on the horizon of the world, and it will conquer. If you enjoyed this discussion, you will probably enjoy other products of the Cato Institute, including tapes of policy forums, monographs, books, and publications. For more information on the Cato Institute, write to Cato Institute, 1000 Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20001, or call 202-842-0200. For a catalog of Cato publications, call toll-free 1-800-767-1241 or visit our site on the World Wide Web at http colon slash slash www.cato.org. We hope that you have enjoyed this presentation of the Cato University, a project of the Cato Institute.